going to show you a very quick video that's going to really, in essence, introduce you to this man that will be speaking to you in the next few moments. Listen to me very carefully. Don't let anything or anyone next to you, in front of you, or behind you distract you from the words that you're going to hear in the next few moments because these words can prove to change the rest of your life forever, and I'm not exaggerating. And I ask you to open up your heart and to listen. Listen objectively. If you're here for the first time or maybe you were invited by a friend or maybe you just say, man, I don't believe in this stuff, but I just came because someone invited me. That's perfectly fine. That's okay. That doesn't, that doesn't bother God. It doesn't threaten God at all. He's bigger than your doubts. But I ask you to open up your heart and just listen objectively in the name of Jesus. If you can put that video up, please. What happened to cause this incredible 23 minutes that changed your life? You know, Pastor Phil, this message is really so important, not because of my experience, but because the eternal consequences for the decision if people reject Jesus Christ, they really have no idea what they're facing. Mm. Hell is so severe. If anybody could see it for five seconds, mm. it would change their life. Right. That's why Jesus came was a plant across right in the middle of that road that we're all on. Amen. So all we have to do is look up to the cross. He'll take us off that road. One second after we die, it's too late. The only opportunity people have is right now while they're alive. You have to choose now. Choose life. I don't care what you're raised with. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you will end up in this place for all eternity. That's horrible to contemplate. It is. It's horrible. Ninety, uh, over 90% 90 of the people in America walking the street today believe in God, but only 4% believe in hell. Right. And only 2% believe they're going to go there. Right. You, and some people think, well, can't God let somebody out of hell after a couple hundred years or so? But see, that yeah. works. Time is the wrong premise. It has nothing to do with time. It's to do with relationships. That's powerful. The fear level in hell is so intense. It's so far beyond anything I can describe. I felt completely isolated, um, lonely, hopeless. Hell is a real place. You want to avoid it at all costs. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, but he rose again and lives forevermore. This decision is too serious. Make your way down to the front. That's the hands all over. Give Jesus the praise tonight. How many's glad tonight for Bill Weiss and we're still coming. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I am now a born again Christian. Let's rejoice in Jesus name. I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand. So I'd like for you to pray. For you that are at this altar, this is about as scripturally sound that I, I, I've ever heard in my entire life. That's why Jesus warned about hell. 46 verses, he warned us. And 18 of those verses are about the fires of hell. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and come down to the front. Anybody that raised their hand or... Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God. Woo! Hallelujah! This is the, the clearest presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I have ever heard in almost 40 years of being a believer in Jesus, a Christian. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are going. It's something about taking a stand for God. When you walk out of your seat and you come forward, you're showing Him, I mean business, I'm not doing this half-heartedly. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Can we tell Bill Weiss how much we love and appreciate him bringing us truth? from God's Word today. I don't serve God because I'm afraid of hell. I serve Him because He's the most wonderful person you'll ever meet, Jesus. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Bill Weiss. Come on, stand. Let's give the Lord a clap offering.
Please be seated. Pastors Daniel and Jennifer, thank you so much for having my wife and I back here today again at Faith World Church. An honor to be in your pulpit and an honor to be back here. So you guys are all blessed to have them as your pastors. Amen. Amen. We fell in love with them right when we met them, and they really got a pure heart for God and such a hunger for the Word of God and a love for you. So we're very blessed to know them. That's right. Praise God. It's hard to see up here. You know, if you were comfortably lying by a poolside and enjoying the the water and so forth and you saw some evil men pull up with a truck and they drain the pool down halfway and they fill it up with acid then they throw a piece of metal in and it disintegrates the metal you would know they're up to no good well if you saw some children coming from around the corner running and they see the pool and they're running and they're going to dive into the water what would you do would you just lie there and think not my kids Now, you wouldn't do that, would you? You would do anything to stop them from diving in that water because you know what's going to happen to them. Well, that's how I felt after I saw hell. I thought most people don't know that hell is a real place. And it gave me such an urgency to warn people because just like if you were lying by the pool, you would be warning those people because you love them. You don't want them to die. A horrible death like that. So I just want to instill in you Christians an urgency to let people know about Jesus Christ because they don't realize that at the end of their life they're getting ready to jump off into an eternal fire. It's not just a temporal thing. They'll be in eternal fire for all eternity. There was a 2013 Barna poll that showed that 71% of Americans believe in hell but actually less than Uh, one half of one percent believe they're going to go there yet Jesus said in Matthew 7 many are going there and few are going to heaven the poll also showed that 54 percent of Americans believe that if you do good works you'll enter heaven yet Ephesians 2 8 9 says we're saved by grace not by works in addition the poll showed that less than 32 percent of Americans believe that hell is a place of torment yet Jesus said where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched where they're cast into outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He mentioned everlasting fire, everlasting damnation, and everlasting punishment. So we all have a choice. Do we believe Jesus or the Poles? I'm just here to share with you some information that will enable you to make an informed decision about your afterlife because you could be on the wrong path. You know, the wisest man that ever lived was King Solomon, except for Jesus. And he said in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So this is not a message of condemnation. This is a message of love because it's a message of warning. And I'm going to show you that it's not... God sending people to hell it's our own words that send us to hell on November 23rd 1998 I had an experience that changed my life it doesn't matter if you believe my experience what matters is that you check out what the word of God has to say and avoid hell just the same this was not a near death experience that I had this was an out of body experience that would be classified as a vision in the Bible in 2 Corinthians 12 1 and 2 Paul when he was caught up into heaven in a vision he said whether in the body or out of the body he didn't know well the Lord showed me that I left my body so in a vision you can actually travel Paul and John actually traveled to heaven in their spirit bodies 1 Corinthians 15 44 talks about a natural body and a spirit body In Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel was picked up by his hair and he was carried from Babylon to Jerusalem in a vision. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept. He conversed. My point is in a vision, you can experience the same things in your spirit body that you would in your physical body. And it's just as real. And this is not to compare my experience with any of these great men in the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. I've been a Christian for 48 years. The only way a Christian can see hell is in a dream or a vision. And in Job 7, 14 says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. So you can have a terrifying vision. 
Isaiah 21, 2, he was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4, 14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can't have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. Now you might say, Bill, but I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. Why do I need to hear about hell? Three quick reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what you were saved from. That's right. You see, a lot of Christians today believe in a teaching called annihilationism. And that's a teaching that says if you deny Jesus, you simply are annihilated. You cease to exist. Well, that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these shall go into everlasting life and these shall go into everlasting punishment. He used the word everlasting is the word ionios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. It says the same thing in John 5, 29. Mark 16, 16, Daniel 12, 2, Acts 24, 15, Matthew 13, 30, many other verses that point out that hell is eternal and you will thank God he saved you from this horrible place. Number two, it causes us as Christians to walk more in the fear of the Lord. See, a lot of Christians today live compromised lifestyles. They think, you know, years ago I said the, the prayer, so I'm in the born again club, you know. And they lived the, like the devil, basically. But Jesus said in Mark 9, 47, if your eye offends thee, and the word offend means causes you to sin, he said, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than in the hell fire. So he's warning us, if you're playing around with sin, you're in danger of hell fire. So when you understand how severe hell is, you will not want to play around with sin. You want to walk the straight walk and walk circumspect and walk in holiness before the almighty God. And what is the fear of the Lord? Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 17 says, the fear of the Lord is simply to read his word and to obey his word. See that you have enough respect for Almighty God that you say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. See, it's that healthy reverential fear of Almighty God that keeps us walking the straight walk. Now, I know we, we are to cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. But at first, we have to have a healthy reverential fear for Almighty God because there's consequences for our actions. There's a law of sowing and reaping. David said in Psalms 119, 120, I greatly fear thy judgments. So when you understand God's a holy God, you'll want to walk straight before God. Plus, you don't want to offend the God that's done so much for you. You want to please him. That's the real main reason. You want to please God. And number three, it'll give us all more of a passion for the lost, a desire to witness. See, most Christians, Bill Bright said only 2% of Christians even bother to witness. Yet we're all called to do that. It's not just uh, Pastor Daniel's job. It's all of us are called to be a witness for God. And it's not just come to church and hear a message and go home and never open up your mouth. No, God has commissioned us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's our job. And you know what? It's a privilege and an honor. We're entrusted with the gospel. That's an honor. The most valuable thing is God's word, and he's entrusted us with it to go and share it with people so their eternity can be changed by words you say. But it's also, uh, Charles Spurgeon said, 90% of our witness is through our life example. Do we show up on time for work? Do we keep our word? Do we work with excellence? Are we quick to forgive people that are ugly to us? Do we love people that are mean and ugly to us? That's most of our witness, and the world is observing you. They're watching everything you do. And so God wants us to walk circumspect before him, and that's a witness to the world. But also we are to open up our mouth and share the gospel. And I'm not talking about to chase people down on the street and beat them over the head with the Bible. I'm just talking about every day when you get up, you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and you say, Lord, use me today. Put me in front of somebody today that I can share your word with. See, when you have that heart, God will put people in front of you. He'll place them in front of you. He'll give you that opportunity. And then you're watching. See, you're keenly watching for a door that will open that you can share the good news with people. And see, the difference of the heart? Well, when you understand hell, you think, man, I didn't know hell was that severe. I've got to tell my family. I've got to tell my friends. They can't go to this place. You'll be more passionate about the Word of God and you'll be watching for those opportunities. That's what I'm talking about, that understanding hell, that's what it'll do, instill in you. It'll give you that passion. 
My wife and I went to a prayer meeting we attended every Sunday night, nothing unusual about the night. Uh, at this point in life, I had never studied the topic of hell. I'd never gone to dark movies. I've never drank, I've never taken drugs, and I never had a vision before. And I got, we came home like any other normal night, went to bed, I got up at three o'clock in the morning to get a glass of water. And I was walking to the living room, and suddenly I was pulled out of my body, like being drawn up out of your body. I saw my body drop to the floor. And I started tumbling down this long tunnel. And it was getting hotter and hotter. And then I entered this like open cavern-like area and I landed in an actual stone floor, on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. I had no idea how I got there or why I was there. I was fully awake and cognizant, just like I'm standing here now, in this filthy, stinking, dirty, smoke-filled, but more like a dungeon. But see, Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says, They shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, he said, The earth with her bars was about me forever. Jonah 2, 2, he was in hell. And uh, so there is somebody in the Bible that actually saw hell. And the Tyndale, the New International Commentary, and some others point out that Jonah was actually at the gates of hell, and it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's where I found myself, face down on the floor in this prison cell. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was so far beyond the ability to sustain life, I wondered, how could I be alive in this place? I should be dead. So my reaction was I wanted to get up and run. I just had that get up and run out of this prison cell. But I noticed I couldn't hardly move. I thought, what's wrong with my body? It, it, had, it took so much effort to even move. But see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now, if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, what's well, a thousand times worse than that? Any movement takes tremendous effort in hell. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. Well, I looked up and I saw these two demons in the cell. They were reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long, and these particular two are about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. I could give you scripture for that, but I better keep moving. And they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal. They had the most ferocious demeanor about them, and they were blaspheming and cursing God. They had an extreme hatred for God, but we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, some other verses. Then they directed that hatred they had for God, they directed towards me. I wonder why, what have I done to them? But this one demon grabbed me, picked me up, threw me into the wall of this prison cell. Tremendous strength demons have, and you have none. I hit the wall of this prison cell, and I felt as if bones had broken. I'm just telling you how it felt. I collapsed on the floor of the cell, and I wondered why am I alive through that? I should be dead but I wasn't. And, but I noticed though, I have to explain one thing, I only felt part of the pain that you normally would feel. I, I, I understood then it was being blocked. I didn't understand quite, but the Lord explained on the way back that he allowed me to feel a small amount of the pain. He blocked most of it, but he allowed me to feel a small amount so I could relate to people. It's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. There's real literal pain you're gonna feel in hell. But the amount I felt was enough. Then this other demon grabbed me, picked me up, dug its claws into my chest, and just ripped the flesh open. I couldn't believe I'm living through this. Why am I living? I should be dead. I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man Jesus talked about, he wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He was able to speak. He had a mouth to speak. He had eyes to lift. He had a tongue. So you have a body in hell, but it withstands these torments. But something else I noticed, there was no, uh, it was dry from the wounds. There was no 
uh, any, no blood or water coming from the wounds that, when he ripped my flesh open. But see, Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. But see, Psalms 103.17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell. So you don't derive the benefit of mercy. About this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see. But then he withdrew his light and it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. But see, Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 30, Cast them in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel the darkness. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. I don't know. It just, it's so wicked and evil and dark, it just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body. I was taken out of this prison cell uh, by God, but I didn't realize that then. I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. And this pit was about a mile across. I just had that understanding. And this giant hole in the ground with flames raging high up in this open cavern. And it wasn't metaphorical or allegorical flames. I saw the fire, I felt the heat, but more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11:6 says, Upon the wicked he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, The angel shall sever the wicked from the just, cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Isaiah 33, 12 says, The people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Many more scriptures I could give you about fire, but this is where I could first see people inside this pit. There were literally thousands of people screaming and burning. And most of us have never seen a person on fire. It's the most awful sight to see somebody burning. You cannot distinguish a man from a woman. They just look like skeletons with, look like flesh hanging off their bones, screaming. And the screams were so loud and deafening. You want to get away from the screams, but you can't. But see, Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of any kind in hell. But see, um, Isaiah 32, 18 says, My people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not his people. So you don't derive the benefit of even quiet. Now, I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. But more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that talk about where the current hell, or Hades is the Greek word, Sheol is the Hebrew word for the current hell. But there's 49 verses. I'll just give you two. Ezekiel 26, 20. Numbers 16, 32, and 33. Very clear, it's down deep in the earth, but I understood that. And I also understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. But remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation, inferring there's a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That infers a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, Of how much worse of a punishment suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is, there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any level is far worse than you can even imagine. I wanted to talk to my wife. I wanted to let her know where I was at. But I had the understanding I'll never get that opportunity. See, Job 7, 9 says, He that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. And you understand that. And you'll never get to say goodbye to your family. You don't realize what a tormenting thought that is. That for all eternity, you'll have no finality with your family. They don't know that you still exist, that you're down deep in the earth suffering. They don't know that. And uh, 
You know, it's like if you go to a funeral today, it's usually stated, no matter what the religion is, they'll usually state, well, they've gone to a better place. But that's not the case for most. And you're suffering down here for all eternity. And no finality with your family. It's just an awful thing to think about that. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> it's a place of confusion. Jeremiah 20, 11, Isaiah 45, 16 mention everlasting confusion. Job 10, 22, a land without any order. You know how we like things in order in life, right? Order, because we serve a God of order. Well, hell's the antithesis. It's chaotic, confusion, hectic. Nothing makes any sense in hell. You need to sleep in hell. Now, I was only there 23 minutes, but I felt like I was there 23 weeks. And have you ever stayed up for just two nights without going to bed? Try to stay up for two nights. Don't go to sleep. You can't even function after two days. Well, in hell, you need to sleep also, <clears throat> but you never get to go to sleep. See, Revelation 14, 10, and 11 says, And they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. You never get to rest. See, but because Isaiah 57, 20 says, The wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea is always moving, can't rest. Well, you can't rest either in hell because you're in constant torment. But see, rest is a blessing from God. Psalms 127.2 said, The Lord gives His beloved sleep. You're not His beloved. So you don't ever get to go to sleep in hell. You have no purpose, no destiny. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. It's just a complete useless wasting away. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, Your name is covered in darkness. And you're completely forgotten in hell. Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.14, Deuteronomy 32.26, Psalms 109.15. Many verses talk about being forgotten. And you don't realize how tormenting that is. Because, see, the people up on the earth, I mean, you don't think about people in hell, do you? No, you don't think about them. See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. You're just down deep in the earth. I was standing next to this big pit of fire and demons were shoving people back in. People were... <laughs> explain something those people in the fire that I saw thousands of people they're all kept at a distance they're not next to each other so you have no conversation with anybody ever again you're isolated and alone and by yourself and I could see only through the flames and along the edges it's so dark in hell you know a pit a mile across here on the earth if it was a whole mile across with flames it would light up a huge area right but in hell it doesn't it is so dark it consumes the light so I could only see through it and along the edges. And I was standing beneath a tunnel, like a cavern walls ascending upward. And all along the cavern walls were demons, all twisted, deformed, grotesque, the most hideous looking creatures. And some were only two and three feet tall, some were 12 and 13 feet tall. And there were snakes crawling all over everything. And then I noticed, I looked down and I was standing on a bed of maggots solid maggots but remember Jesus said where their worm dies not and he used the word maggot and he personalized it by saying their worm disgusting I'm just trying to give you Bible Isaiah 14 11 says where the maggot is spread under thee and the worm will cover thee look it up in the original it's the word maggot 
And I never knew this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, I know this is disgusting, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, after they consume the flesh, maggots die. I never knew that, but they will die after they consume the flesh. That's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24.20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? You're hungry. You never get to eat. You have that feeling of hunger for all eternity. Thirst. Remember the rich man Jesus talked about in Luke 16? He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He was tormented in the flame. Well, if I was to give you one drop of water, that wouldn't suffice, would it? One drop. You wouldn't value one drop. But in hell you would. You would do anything for that one drop. And just think that rich man 2,000 years ago that was longing for that drop, he's still longing for it and he'll never get it. The fear that you experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. And you know, the Bible says fear has torment. And a lot of us have gone through some kind of fear in life. I'm going to share with you an experience I had so you can try to relate to the fear because this fear in hell is for all eternity. It's not just for a few seconds. When I was a teenager, I was 17 years old, and I was surfing. I used to surf a lot as a teenager. We were surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida, and there was about 100 guys out that day having a great time. Well, suddenly, the guy next to me got his leg torn off. Now there were sharks all over the water and blood all over, and I got up on my nine-foot-long board, and I got up on my knees to get my feet out of the water, and a shark passed by. He was longer than my board. Then he came back, and he bit my board in half. It was a tiger shark. That's a tiger shark. If you know anything about tiger sharks, they're vicious, they eat anything, and they don't let you go. Well, that shark came back, grabbed my leg, and pulled me down under the water. Now, you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment. There's not much more fearful than that. Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even register. But see, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. Consumed with terror. This terror is for all eternity, though. But you know, praise God, the shark not openly, not only opened its mouth, but there wasn't a mark in my leg. That's impossible. Once they grab you, your leg would be shredded. But God was looking out for me then. Praise God. And you know, I was, not, I was not even a Christian then. But I got saved immediately after that. So, praise God. Thank you, Lord. And that's right. Hey, we serve a good and a loving God. Amen? That's right. Praise the Lord. I got to enjoy my leg all these years. Thank you, Lord. You know, I want to just take a minute and give you scripture about being tormented in hell. I know I've been giving you scripture, but that's what's important for you to hear, not my experience. And so some people say, come on, Bill, aren't you exaggerating? I mean, do demons tormenting? That's your idea of hell. No, that's the Bible's idea of hell. So can you bear with me for another minute while I give you some scripture? Okay? All right. Matthew 18, 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12, 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. Who's doing the beating? Psalms 50, verse 22. You that forget God, you'll be torn in pieces. Matthew 24, 51. I will cut them in pieces where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 116, 3. The pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5, 18 and 19. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? Judgment day. It'll be darkness. And as a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Job 33, 22. His soul draws near to the pit and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141, 7. Their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49, 14. Their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. Psalms 32.10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Psalm 78.49, I will cast my wrath upon them by sending evil angels among them. Deuteronomy 32.22, 22, 
for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with poison of serpents of the dust. Matthew 22:13. Jesus said, Bind them hand and foot and cast them into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, Luke 19, 27, bring my enemies that will let, not let me reign over them and slay them before me. Psalm 74, 20 says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Full of the habitations of cruelty. Look up the word cruelty in the original Hebrew in uh, the Strong's number 2555. It's the word Hamas. We've heard that word, word, word before, right? The terrorist group Hamas. The word Hamas means ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. So for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. Well, that's what you're experiencing in hell. Now you say, Bill, why would God make such a horrible place? Well, Jesus said why. In Matthew 25, 41, he said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go to this place. But he used the word prepared. It's the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven or make ready. So he was preparing heaven for us, hell for the devil. But what he did in the preparation was, you see, James 1, 17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So all the good we enjoy in life, the fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all that good comes from God. It's not automatic. So what he did in the preparation was he simply withdrew his goodness or his attributes. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1, 5 said God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11.11 11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9.6 says he is the prince of peace. So see, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. You can't separate the two. So if you're a person in life that says, you know what, I don't want anything to do with God. Well, fine, there's a place prepared that has nothing to do with him. Can you see that? Now, other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. Also, the scripture, it says he will pour out his wrath on sin in the form of fire. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. It's your choice. It's your choice. You know, when people look at the mountains, the trees, the ocean, and they say, oh, isn't Mother Nature wonderful? No, that's not Mother Nature. That's Father God that provided all these good things. Amen? <clears throat> that's right. Psalms 33, 5 says, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. We get to enjoy his goodness while you're here in life, but if you reject Jesus, you go to a place that's absent from his goodness. As I was looking at all this horror, demons shoving people back in, maggots, all this disgust, something began lifting me up this dark tunnel. And in the middle of this pitch black darkness, suddenly this bright light appeared. And I, I knew immediately who it was. There's no doubt in your mind when Jesus shows up. And I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, pure, holy light. It was like no light I had ever seen. And I just called out his name. I said, Jesus. And he said, I am. And when he said, I am, I went out. I, I don't know if I died, passed out. I was gone. But I can just tell you that, you know, John, in John 1, uh, Revelation 1, 16, said, when he saw him, his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. Well, that's what happened to me. But after a time, he touched me. And when I came to, it hit me so strongly. Even though I've been a Christian at that time for 28 years, it hit me. If he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. I was so grateful for the cross. 
I just wanted to thank him. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for me on the cross, Lord. Thank you for giving your life for me, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I was so grateful. I didn't want to ask him any questions. But thoughts started coming to my mind. And he, he would answer my thoughts. Psalms 139, 2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I first thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. That statement shocked me. I thought, wait a minute, don't all Christians believe in hell? But we have found out since many believe in, like I said, annihilationism or universalism. That's a teaching that says everybody gets saved no matter what. Or soul sleep, you just go to sleep. There's many false teachings out there. And he wanted me to point people to the scripture. I'm just a signpost to point them to the scripture so they can check it out for themselves so they can avoid this horrible place. But hell has been downplayed today and not talked about, you know, so there's a lack of the fear of the Lord, you know, and, and he wants to point out, God doesn't want anybody to go there, but he wants them to know how serious it is. You know, if they realize... If they reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, if they understand they're going to go to this place for all eternity and there is no second chances. You will not get out. They're going to wake up maybe when they understand how severe it is. You can't reach everybody by just saying, you know, Jesus loves you. That doesn't reach everybody. Some say, oh, I don't want to hear that. I don't care about that. You know, and Jude 23 says, some are saved through fear pulling them out of the fire. Sometimes you've got to shake people up and let them know, hey man, this is where you're going. Your choice if you end up in hell. God's trying to keep you out. I said, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. That's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I'll go. But I have to admit, I complained for seven years. You know, my wife and I worked in real estate. I had a company. I was making a half a million dollars a year. What do I need this for to travel? I only told one close friend, and he invited me to his Bible study. And I said, no, I don't want to go. Well, I went finally three months later reluctantly. Well, it spread from there. We began getting invited all around the country. So for the next seven years, my wife would take her two days off a week plus her vacation time, and I owned my own company. So we would travel wherever we were invited. We never asked for any place to go, and we paid our own way. We never took one penny from anybody for those seven years. And after that time, the publisher came to me and said, Bill, would you write a book on your experience? I said, I'm not a writer. I'm just a real estate broker. Besides, who would read my book? I'm not anybody important, you know. And, uh, but I wanted to write it because I wanted to place in there all the scriptures because that's what's important for people to believe. So I thought, good, I'll write it and I have all the verses in there because I did researched it for those seven years. But the, my point was I complained to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm conservative. I don't like public speaking, number one. I'm conservative. I don't like sharing this message about hell. I pictured somebody that had wild hair and a wooden sign standing on a street corner screaming, repent or burn. I mean, th that's what I envisioned. I thought, I don't, I don't need that. I don't want to be identified with that. And I complained to the Lord for seven years, and he put up with me. I went anyway, but I didn't like it. And the Lord spoke to me one day and said, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. I felt so convicted. But you know, it doesn't, right now, it doesn't matter if I feel uncomfortable in any way. Because if one person can come to the light of the scripture and avoid this horrible place, hey, it's worth any uncomfortableness I would ever feel. And now I'm, my wife and I are honored to do what God's called us to do. But you know, I found out something. God's called every single one of us to do something for him. And another thing I discovered, there are no big shots with God. We all are equally important, and we need each other. It's a team effort to win souls. And, and you're a unique individual. Whatever God's given you a gift of, you know, I can't do what you can do. Just use your talent and your gift to the fullest because we don't have a lot of time. You've got to get involved. You're not just here to warm the pew. 
You can do something for God. Get involved in the ministry. Pass out tracts. Help with the children. Help with the audio, visual, or uh, just help do anything at church. Maybe it's your job. Maybe you're called to be an accountant or an attorney. Whatever you're called to do, just use your ability for God and watch for opportunities to witness because we all have a sphere of influence. We can reach people that you can reach people that I can't. So use your reaching ability to get to those people. I thought, Lord, why, why didn't I know you? I didn't explain to you that God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. You say, Bill, where's that in the Bible? Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holden that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's commentary point out that, quote, they were kept by God from recognizing them. And other places of this are in John 20, 14, Luke 18, 34, Daniel 4, 34, 2 Kings 4, 27, all places where God hid something from their mind for a reason, and he hid it from my mind for this reason. You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't know, I, I would have known as a Christian, praise God, he's getting me out of here, right? I would have known that. But as an unsaved person, that's what he wanted me to experience. See, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. See, and they understand they're not ever going to get out. And see, none of us in life know what it's like to be really hopeless. Because even if your situation is so dire, you're in agony and pain, you understand you can die to get out of the pain, right? But in hell, you understand there's no one going to come rescue you. There's no angels. There's no God to pray to. And you understand this pain you're experiencing and this torment is forever. You'll be there 100 million years, and that's still day one. Can you let that sink in for a minute? Can you see why this decision is so important? And people slough it off and they think, ah, I don't believe in that Bible stuff or I can think about it later. And they don't know that they might, they might not even have later. <laughs> and one second after you die, it's too late. You'll not get a second chance. <clears throat> we came up above the earth and we were in this whirlwind tunnel. And there's many scriptures for that too, but I'm going to keep moving. And the Lord had me turn around and look in this whirlwind and people were falling one after another, after another, back down into hell. We just came out of there. And he allowed me to feel just a piece of his heart. And he wept. And the anguish he feels for his soul falling into hell. He doesn't want to see one person go to hell. And I said, Lord, stop. I don't even want to feel a little bit of the anguish you're feeling for a person going to hell. But he wanted me to remember that. See, his love is so far past our ability to conceive. Ephesians 3.19 says, his love passes knowledge. See, he loves us way more than you can imagine. And the Lord showed me this scripture. Psalms 139, 17 and 18, David said, your thoughts toward me are all precious. And I suppose if I should count them, they are more than the sands. And another verse says, more than the sands on the whole earth. Now, we read over that glibly and think, oh, that's nice. But the Lord said, no, look at this. If you picked up a handful of sand, there'd be thousands of granules in your hand, right? A lot of granules. If each one represented a thought. And I took a granule and I said, I love how my wife prays for me all the time. I love how beautiful she is. I love how she honors her parents. I love how she prays for others. And you came back three or four hours from now, and I'm still trying to exhaust the granules in my hand. You would say, Bill is really gone over his wife. Man, he is crazy about her, right? That's just to exhaust the amount in my hand. Well, God says his thoughts toward each one of us are more than the sands on the whole earth. And, and see, here's another thing. God cannot exaggerate. So can you imagine how many granules there are on the whole earth? And every single granule represents a good thought God has for you. A precious thought. Now can you see how much he loves us? <clears throat> he doesn't want one person to go to hell. He's trying to keep them out of hell. Throughout their whole life, he warns people over and over in all kinds of ways, sending people across their path. He gives TV, missionaries are sent across the world. There's even a scripture in Job 33 that says, he even gives man dreams and visions to keep back his soul from the pit. So God is trying to get through to people throughout their whole life. He's not wanting to send anybody. He doesn't send anybody. He gives you a free will to choose. 
We came back to my home and I saw my body lying on the floor. I came back into my body. It was so strange to see your body. It was like, that's not me. This is the real me. This is the eternal me. That's temporary. That body's temporary. I'll tell you, it looked just like your car. If you get out of your car, it's a vehicle to get you around in life, but it's not you. It's just something to get you around in. That's how the body looked. <clears throat> Temporal. And, but he showed me a puff of smoke came up. I said, Lord, what's that? Life is but a vapor, James 4.14. He said, that's your life. I said, that's it? And See, I was in eternity now with the Lord, so our life looked so temporal. It went up like a puff of smoke. It was over in two seconds. I said, Lord, we don't have much time. He said, yes, but what you do for me during that short time, I will count for all eternity. <laughs> Glory to God. <clears throat> See, that gave me an eternal perspective. Do something for God. Sacrifice whatever it takes now because you'll be rewarded in heaven for all eternity for what God's called you to do. And we want to please him anyway. Now you say, Bill, how can, though, a loving God send a good person to hell? A good person. Well, number one, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But if you're going to go by the standard of good, then you have to go by God's standard. And James 2.10 says, if we offend his law in one point, we're guilty of all. Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. 1 Corinthians 6.9 says, no thief will inherit heaven. Jesus said, if you commit, if you even have a lustful thought, that's the same as committing adultery. And no adulterer will inherit heaven. That's just three of the Ten Commandments. So if we're going to be judged by that standard, would we be guilty or innocent? We'd all be guilty. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24, 9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If we have one foolish thought our entire life, that would exclude us from heaven. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So none of us can stand before a holy God and say, hey, I'm pretty good, let me in. He's going to say, no, not according to my standard, you're not. As a matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. Thank God it's not based on being good, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? <laughs> But you might not be convinced yet. You might be like a, a secular radio talk show host I was on with, syndicated all across America. He was a tough New Jersey guy. And uh, they warned me about him. They said, Bill, this guy does not like Christians. Be careful on his show. So I went on the show and he says, okay, Christian, don't you quote me one Bible verse on my airwaves. You got that? I don't want to hear none of that Bible on my airwaves. I said, okay. He said, I submit to you that you Christians are unreasonable because you don't consider my viewpoint. My viewpoint is just as valid as yours, and I'm a good person, and your God should let me into heaven. And if he doesn't, then he's actually guilty of a hate crime. So what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? Well, what do you say? I'm live on the air. Well, God gave me an analogy. Thank God. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. I said, okay, you think you're a good person. You should be let into heaven. He goes, that's right. I said, okay, say you invited me. Uh, say you went and found the home, the most expensive home in the country, and you knocked on their door, and you said, uh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. People would say, no, right? You don't know them. You wouldn't expect them to let you move in. You have no relationship with them. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as a son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. <clears throat> then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You have no relationship with him. See, God offered, I said, God offers to be your father throughout your whole life. But you said, I don't want you as my father. You pushed him away. See, God is your creator. He's not your father to you invite in Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Then you have the privilege of living in his house. So until then, that's unreasonable to expect that live, to live at somebody's house you don't even know. He said, whoa, you can fight back. That's what he said. He said, well, I submit to you again that you Christians are unreasonable because you're narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. And he said, I think all roads lead to heaven. That's what I think. I said, okay, let me give you another analogy. Thank God God gave me another analogy. 
I said, okay, you say you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. But that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I think I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. Oh, you're going to tell me, Bill, I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. That's what God's doing. He's giving us clear directions. I think God knows where he lives, right? That's not narrow-minded. That's specific. He's given us clear, specific directions on how to get to his house. He's not trying to keep us out. But see, people think God's up there arbitrarily saying, well, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. It's not that way. All of us above the age of accountability are automatically on the road to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 says we're condemned already because we're born in sin. Psalms 51, 2. So see, that's different than being sent there. We're already going there. That's why Jesus came, was the plan of cross right in the middle of that road that we're all on. So we have to look up to the cross, repent of our sin, receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and he'll take us off that road. Just that simple. He said, well, can't God overlook my sins? I mean, I don't kill anybody. You know, that's the other misconception. If you don't kill anybody, you're good enough for heaven. I said, no, God cannot overlook our sins for two reasons. Number one, he's a just judge. And a good judge in our land would not let the criminal go free. The crime has to be punished. But Jesus paid that punishment for us. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. It's your choice. But the second reason he cannot overlook our sins is because Hebrews 12, 29 and Nahum 1, 5 said, God is a consuming fire. And it says in Nahum 1, 5 that all of us in our present state, our fallen nature, would be consumed in his presence. We'd be consumed. <clears throat> and so see, it's like this. If I stuck my hand into the fire to retrieve something and the fire burned me, I wouldn't say, why'd that fire burn me? That was mean of that fire. I wouldn't say that, would I? Why? Because the nature of the fire is to burn. My hand and fire are not compatible. Well, neither is a holy God and sinful man compatible. So if we showed up in his presence the way we are, we would be consumed. We have to have a new nature. We have to have God's nature. How can that happen? Only one way. If someone came and lived the perfect life and never sinned once, not even a foolish thought, and that's Jesus Christ. And he stands before the Father and says, I've never sinned. I'm going to exchange my right standing with you, Father, for their sin. If they would trust in my work on the cross and not their own works, Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. If we would trust in the cross and have a humble heart and say, man, I'm a sinner. I can't get to heaven. But I believe Jesus paid for my sins. Then he considers our trust in him as if we were righteous. Then he gives us that new nature. Our sins are dealt with by Jesus. He washes them away with his blood. So now we can stand before a holy God as if we've never sinned because our sins are dealt with and God gives us a new nature that's compatible with his. Now we can enter heaven. Isn't that an awesome plan that God came up with? You know, people say, I don't like this one-way business you Christians have. You ought to be grateful there is a way. God made a way where there was none. You know, it's like if you went to a doctor and you had a disease and the doctor said, take this pill. This is the only known cure for this disease. And you say, I'm offended. I don't like it that there's only one way. I'm not going to take that pill. That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? Well, man's, man has a fatal disease. It's called sin. And there is only one cure, and that's Jesus Christ. Take the pill and live. You know, this is the clear directions to heaven. John 3.36 says, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You have to know the Son. How do you do that? Just two verses. Jesus said in Luke 13.3, Unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. What does repent mean? That means, again, to have a humble heart and say, God, I, I know I've sinned. I can't save myself, but I'm willing to turn away from sin and follow you. See, it's not enough to mentally assent to the fact and say, yeah, I can believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that. And then go live your own life and do your own thing. That's not repentance. 
You need to repent, and that, that takes a humble heart to agree to turn away from sin. Now, on your own, you can't resist sin. But when you come to God and you get born again, he gives you a new nature and he gives you the grace or the ability to, to resist the sin. Now you have the grace, the power, the ability to resist the sin. But right now, you just have to be willing to turn away and follow Jesus. That's number one. Number two, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You have to believe in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You want to live at his house? You do it his way. There's only one way. Now, if you say, Bill, I just don't believe you. Well, I have a verse for you then. Revelation 21, 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. He just gave you the warning. If you don't believe the word of God, that he's the son of God and he died for your sins, if you don't believe that, he just told you where you will go. Now, that's why you can see why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you because you said, I don't believe the Bible. You send yourself to hell by rejection of the provision for our sins, which is Jesus Christ. You don't want to do that. You know, Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book and he's going to look to see if your name is in his book. And can you imagine a judgment day standing there and he said, your name's not here because you chose, you chose to push me away. I tried to get through to you over and over again, but you wouldn't listen. He wouldn't want to say these next words, but he'd have to say, depart from me into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That'd be the worst words you could ever hear. You know, when the Titanic set sail, there were all different religions and all different walks of life on that ship, and they say there were three classes of people, the lower, the middle, and the upper class. But when the ship went down, at the White Star Line office in Liverpool, England, there were two signs posted, and the relatives would come out each day and wait for a man to come out, and he would write one of the members of the ship down on one of the signs. And one of the signs said, known to be saved. The other one said, known to be lost. Now, when the ship left, there were all different beliefs, all different walks of life, all different religions, and three classes of people. But in the end, there's only two. You're either saved or you're lost. It's your choice. So my question for you is, do you know if your name is written in his book? You have to be certain of this one. You do not want to take a chance with your soul. Because whether you realize it or not, your soul is eternal. And you'll spend it in one place or the other, whether you believe it or not. And heaven is not our default destination. There needs to be a purposeful act on our part in order to enter heaven. And again, because God loves you, he gives you the free will to choose. He tells you clearly how to get to heaven. And what will happen if you deny Jesus? So you're forewarned. So in the end, you can't point your finger at God and say, how come you're so mean to send me to hell? He's saying, hey, I've, I've tried to keep you out. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't give you a free will. Please don't think, you know, I can think about this later. Because you don't realize if, you're, if you leave here, your heart actually grows harder. You don't know that but it grows harder and it's more difficult to reach you and you don't even know that you'll have tomorrow plus John 6 44 Jesus said you can't even come to the father unless he draws you so you don't even have a choice tomorrow you have to come when he's calling you and he's calling you right now this is your opportunity don't be foolish and miss out on an opportunity like this This is not just an invitation, because you can turn down an invitation. This is an opportunity. People miss opportunities all the time, but this one, you don't want to miss. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you here today, and you say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book. I'm not certain, but I would like to be certain. I'd like to know. Well, you can know that. You can have full assurance of your salvation today. 
And you don't have to give up anything to come to God. You don't have to clean up your life to come to Him. He cleans us up. You just come as you are. And you don't give up anything when you come to God. You only gain. I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand. If that's you, if you'd say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book, but I want it to be. Also, anybody here that would say, you know, my life, I know better, but I haven't been living right for God. I, I just been compromised and I, I just want to get things straight with God. I need his help. I want his help. If that's you, I'm going to ask you too to raise your hand at the count of three. One, two, three. Slip up your hands, your hands. I see your hands, I see your hands. Don't be embarrassed about this. Most of us have done this. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. You want to make sure he sees that hand. If everybody would stand to their feet, everybody stand to their feet. I'm going to invite each person that raised their hand. I'm going to challenge you to get out of your seat, come down to the front, and give us the privilege of praying for you. Just come down to the front. I know it takes some guts to get out of your seat, but it shows God you mean business. Just make your way down. the wisest decision any of us could ever make you know if you could see hell for five seconds and you didn't know the Lord you'd come running to this altar it's that bad God is so proud of these people that's come forward you know it says that all of heaven celebrates over just one soul that's how valuable everybody is here I'm just going to wait for another 30 seconds and we're going to invite anybody else even one person all of heaven celebrates over you so if you're thinking you know I'm just not sure you can be sure just make your way down to the front God doesn't want to drag anybody up here he wants you to come on your own this is your opportunity wait another 15 seconds we're going to pray there's anybody else? Praise God. God. Praise God. Appreciate everybody's time. This is so important right now because these people's eternities hang in the balance. All right. Anybody else? We're going to pray. All right, I want to ask everybody that came forward, I'm going to ask you just to raise both your hands. It's like an act of surrender, saying, God, you gave your life for me. I'm giving you my life back. And we can all say this prayer together, all of us out there. But you guys are going to say this prayer and repeat after me these words, okay? It'll change your whole eternity. Okay? You ready? Praise God. All right. Say, dear God in heaven, I know that I've sinned and I cannot save myself. But I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. That he was crucified, died and was buried. But he rose again and lives forevermore. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for taking me to heaven. And I now confess, I'm a born-again Christian. Go into heaven, and I'll serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Woo. Praise God. Praise the Lord.
Praise God. I just want to say one more thing to you two, all you people that came up front. Two things to get in the habit of doing each day. Number one, to get in the habit of reading the Bible. It's not a religious exercise. The Bible is actually a manual, an instruction manual for life. It teaches us how to live life and how to obtain all the blessings. God has blessings for us. But also, you have an enemy. We all have an enemy. The devil doesn't like us. But the, w the way we run the devil out of our lives is by the Word of God. Jesus quoted the Word, and the devil fled. But you got to read the Word to have it in your heart to quote it when the devil comes to bother you. So I encourage you to read each day, get the Word in your heart, and you'll get to know how wonderful this Jesus is. You'll get to know Him through reading His Word. You know, when you hang out with a friend, you get to know them. But when you read the Word, you get to know Jesus, how great He is and how much He loves you and the plan that He has for your life. That's number one. Number two, it's so important to go to a good church because you make new friends that will pray for you and you get good teaching and you get support. And so it really makes a difference what you're taught, what church you go to. So you need a good church. And if you don't have one, you're in one right now. Praise God. Thank you so much. God is so proud of you. So proud of you. Thank you all so much, Pastor. Amen. Remember, you to say we, this so we so appreciate you, man of God. You're just such a blessing. He's always been. Wasn't he a tremendous blessing in how he shared his heart and what God showed him? And come on, let's give the Lord a clap off him one more time. Um, a couple of things. Um, those of you that have come forward, we're going to ask you to please do one more thing. If you can please uh, follow uh, Jose here downstairs, if you would be so kind, please, as to just go right through here, just downstairs. Uh, we have something real quickly that's...